Hey there, World Language teachers. Welcome to yet another World Lang Wednesday. We are in, I don't know, maybe even eight or nine of our curriculum series on all things for today, Spanish One. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm really excited about this class because I love Spanish One. I've done Spanish One from day one and it is absolutely my favorite thing to talk about. Level one, is very near and dear to my heart. I love teaching novice learners and I especially love getting teachers into the topic of some of my favorite things along the lines of how do we teach our students about proficiency? How do we properly prepare them for what's in store in our classrooms? And how do we create the community that's necessary in order to set students up for success for a whole productive year of language learning that's very unique to a level one classroom. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a tool that I have for you that I'm going to drop in the comments below so that you've got something to help you with your curriculum map because starting with a really good curriculum map is going to set you up for success for the entire year by saving you planning time so much planning time as you move through the rest of your year. This one teeny tiny document and spending a little bit of time on it is going to pay off dividends. So let's jump right into it. What do you need? Okay, so go to, I want to make sure that I got the right thing in here and put it in the comments below. Go to la libre language learning.com forward slash map for the free download that we need for class today. And I am going to make sure that I'm sharing my screen so that you can see it too. All right, let's get to it. Let me know in the comments if you can see it as well and make sure that everything's working here. I'm gonna check as well to make sure that it's going. All right, cool, looks like we're good and that everything is working. So I'm gonna put this in the comments here where you need to go. It's again, it's www.lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash map and you'll get exactly where I am right now too. Uh, learning um, forward slash map. And you will get to where you need to be. So let's jump right into this here. What on earth is this? This is something called a curriculum map, and this is going to help you a lot as we work through everything that you need in order to create a well-designed Spanish curriculum. So let's take a broader view of what this document is. First of all, it's editable because yeah. So what you can do is you can either type right into this document here, which is my favorite way to do it because I like to tweak as I go, or you can print it out and write in it as well. So we've got the first stage here. This is kind of like a brainstorming area. Our desired results, which is what we we're looking at the end goal here. The very first step of good solid curriculum planning is looking at where do you want your students to be by the end of your course? That's where desired results really comes into play. The next thing we're gonna look at is enduring understandings, essential questions, intercultural communication and performance indicators. And all four of those are actful tools. And if you are unclear on any of those terms, join the club, <laughs> so is everybody else. But these terms, I have a full class on each of these. So you can go back into the library here, right on my Facebook page, and all of them are free, boo, you don't even have to worry about it. So go back to the Facebook page and you'll be able to see something for you. This one specifically for essential questions, performance indicators, and intercultural communication. And I think I talk about enduring understandings a little bit in this one. Go look for the one that says, make can-do's a can-do in your classroom, and you'll be able to see all of these terms laid out for you with examples. We'll work with them a little bit here, but just to make sure this video stays nice and trim, we're not going to get into the real in-depth explanations of these terms. You can go back and watch that video and it'll give you the full rundown here. So make sure you don't miss that. The second part that we're going to do after we, well, let's backtrack for a second. This whole piece here that we are looking at is we're gathering together the standards, the tools, and the specific 
proficiency oriented language to guide us as well as our assessments and our students in evaluating whether we actually reached our goal or not for the course. And to make sure also that our goals are in appropriate places, making sure that we're not putting things that really belong in Spanish three in Spanish one, because we do that a lot as educators, that happens a lot. I know I'm certainly guilty of that. And we'll talk about that as we get through this class. The second thing that we're gonna look at here, stage two, is assessment and evidence. This is when you're really going to dive deep into how am I going to make sure that they're actually hitting all the points up here? The next thing that's important to look at is the structure and the time frame that you're working with. So this is, of course, going to depend on how many contact hours do you have with your students. What that means is how often do you see them, how frequently, and for how long, how many minutes, because that's going to all add up to be your contact hours. And depending on whether it's spread apart, that's also going to influence that. Then finally, we're going to get into units, themes, and topics, which is honestly usually where people start, but it's not a good place to start because then you're starting from a brain dump instead of a place of structure. This, all this jazz is going to save you so much time when you're trying to organize content. Also, full stop, does this look familiar to you? Because it should. This is if you have, well, I shouldn't assume, right? Because everybody's coming from different backgrounds with teaching. I've worked with a lot of teachers who went through different programs in order to get to teaching and might not have gotten um, a teaching degree from the, I guess, the traditional path, you could say. But those of us who have gone through the traditional path are probably familiar with this. It's from the backward design model of curriculum frameworks. So this is adapted from both ACTFL and points if I can say this right, um, Wiggins and McTighe, I believe it is, but this is all from the framework of backward design. And that is just general curriculum creation basics. And then I took themes and principles from what it means to create a world language curriculum in order to adapt this for a world language teacher's needs. Because this framework just in itself of the backward design model, it leaves a little bit to be desired for a world language teacher. So I tweaked it a little bit. Now, the last part here is the learning plan. And this is the part that you'll probably end up spending the most time with. This is stage three. This is the idea of how you're gonna structure the skeleton of the curriculum. Now that's in place. Now that we got all the things out of the way of the time frame and the assessments, we're gonna see if we can figure out exactly what our course is gonna look like. And then the money piece, we've got core structures and skills, which is gonna be We'll get into that at the end of class and I'll show you some examples there, but I'm thinking along the lines of, okay, we're going to make sure that we know all of our question words. All right, we're going to make sure that we know exactly how to get around town if need be. And then for our content words, let's maybe go with the theme of getting around town. Then we're going to make sure that with our content words, we have all the words for, you know, la biblioteca, izquierda, derecha, all those things. Here is why this curriculum map is gonna save your life. Again, this is a free download. Go to lalibrelanguagelearning.com forward slash map and you'll be able to download this. This here shows you not only how you can organize this a little bit better, but also what steps you should do it in because we all have access to information for great ideas, for what could be in your proficiency-centered curriculum. We all have access to incredible resources when it comes to especially if you're coming to the conference this summer, you have incredible resources and teachers around you that are doing inc incredible things in their classroom. You have a lot of information. There's no shortage of it. But what matters is, do you have it in the right order? And are you doing things in the right order? Because trying to reach for things in your curriculum that you might not be ready for in terms of where you're at in your journey to proficiency. Dude, I did that all the time and it was not a good look. Or starting from the bottom won't get you here. Drake will tell you that. That if you are starting from content words, if you're just starting with, you know, I have an idea that I want to do this unit and I want to do that. Or like most people, you're working with a slight framework. You're working with a textbook or you're working with the skeleton of a textbook. Maybe you're just using the table of contents and the units. You know how that, all that jazz goes. Or you're working with a district 
outline and you'd like to supplement with your own pieces and make your own curriculum stronger, that's why you need something like this, then really your content words and your units and all of the topics that you're gonna be teaching are not the best place to start with, even though that's where most people start. You start with that honestly, because it's the easiest. It's the easiest thing for you to think of. But what's gonna save you a million years of planning time is if you go with this first. If you start with the end in mind and think about what do you want your students to be able to do by the time they are done your course? So let's jump on in and start with stage one. And I see we got some people joining the class. Hi, y'all. Welcome, welcome. Tell me, what are, are you teaching Spanish one this year or are you going to be teaching it next year? Because I'm excited to work on this with you. And oh, also let me know, because I've had some questions about this too. What do you currently have as your curriculum? Because this will help us in our class today. Are you working with a little bit of textbook, a little bit of unit, a little bit of your own spin? Are you maybe working with a district lineup? Like, what are you using? Because we can make this map work a little bit better for you. And thanks for joining me. I'm happy to have you. So for our stage one here, I'm currently creating a Spanish one curriculum. And when I sat down to think about what I wanted to happen with my Spanish one curriculum, here's what I did. I thought about my desired results being, and I did this also when I was still in the classroom, I want, I have a mission statement for my students. And this always helps me to choose between another philosophy of mine, good, resources, good units, good topics, good ideas, and great resources, great topics, great ideas, great directions. We don't have that much time with our students. So knowing from the very beginning where I want them to go and putting in a little bit of time with the organization really helps me in those moments, which were a lot, when I was sitting at my desk at 4 p.m. trying to go home on time and thinking to myself, I don't know what I'm gonna teach tomorrow or how I'm going to teach it. When that happened to me a lot, <laughs> maybe you're like me. So if you are thinking to yourself, I, that happens to me a lot, where you're trying to make lesson plans for your next week and you have a small topic in mind, you're thinking to yourself, I know I have to work on how my students are gonna get around town. But honestly, like I have a full library of things that I've downloaded from TPT over five years. I have a very dusty filing cabinet from things that I've hoarded from student teaching and beyond. And honestly, there's just so much of it. Like there's not a lack of things for me to use. I just don't know if it's right for me. This is for you then, mission statement. So without further ado, drum roll please, here's the mission statement. My students will leave or leave Spanish one as empathetic global citizens ready for a digital university. It's just getting worse. <laughs> I need to slow down. University and workforce environment. Okay, so if that's my mission statement and that's my desired result, then being empathetic global citizens means to me also that they are able to understand at a survival level and interact at a survival level, which in actful terms is novice mid really maybe high some of them Inter understand and interact at a survival level in a target language environment by a sympathetic speaker and of course, like the rest of the actual language is going to be who is accustomed to non-native speech, all that good stuff. So that is my specific proficiency target for them is I want them to be novice mid to high. By the time that they leave, most of them are going to be coming in with zero to novice low, a few words here and there. 
Okay, so being able to understand and interact gives us some different things that we need to work with. Being able to understand at a novice level means that we're going to be working with definitely a lot of listening activities. And being able to interact at a survival level also means that we're going to be doing a lot of interacting activities. You'll notice in there that there's nothing about being able to read or write. I will tell you that as a teacher, writing in the target language was not a focus of mine because that's and you're going to be different, right? Every teacher has their own preferences. I've met a lot of teachers who disagree with this strongly, and that's cool. Like, that's your life. Everybody's going to teach differently and have different preferences for what they think is important. For me, my students wanted to speak. They wanted to speak, and they wanted to be able to understand what was being spoken to them. And reading is going to naturally come very easily to your students because it's one of the easier things to grasp on, especially if you're in Spanish one. And personally, while I was studying abroad, I didn't really write that much in Spanish, barely ever. The thing that I really wanted more practice in, and I wish that I did more in the university environment, was interact, was speaking and listening. So we did a little bit of writing in my classes, but really not a lot. That was not a proficiency target that I hit. I knew I had a little bit of time, and that was what I chose to focus on. It's not like we didn't do it, but it wasn't my focus. So speaking quizzes were a big thing in my class. Point of the story being that yours is gonna look different. So understand and interact, your words are gonna be different. Yours might be to be well articulated, especially if you're trying to get them onto, if you have a test for Spanish two or Spanish three that has a writing component, then obviously yours is gonna be different. You might have something along the lines of score a, novice high on presentational writing final exam for entry to Spanish two. That's obviously going to be your goal. And then you know exactly what you're going to need to do in your learning plan. There's going to be a lot of presentational writing. For me, that was in the thing. Let's leave that in there in case that applies to you. Some other desired results that you could think of, like for me, for empathetic global citizens, that of course wraps into, we're obviously gonna be doing lots of cultural things. And that also means that, you know, sometimes you might be veering away from 90% target language in order to become more empathetic global citizens. And I'm okay with that. Your goals may be different. Those are my desired results. Stage one, this is a nice little brainstorming area for you, for you to look at and see where do you already know that you're going to need to focus a lot of your time and energy in order to hit these desired results? And think about if you teach Spanish 2 as well, be thinking about what they're experiencing in Spanish 2. And don't feel weird at all for having your desired results to be fill in gaps between last year and this year, because you know as well as I do that levels are not gonna matter that much. Although this is for when you're doing Spanish two and Spanish three, although for Spanish one, you're probably gonna have a clean slate anyways. Okay, I will tell you also that a desired result for me is to understand proficiency and what it means to be a language learner. You know what that means for me? I know right away that part of my learning plan down here is there's a lot of misconceptions about what it means to be a language learner, right? So I'm going to be doing a unit on language. I need to do a unit on typing. Doing a unit on language, well, learning, me. And let's do acquisition. That's more accurate title language acquisition and study, because I always do that in the first two weeks of my classes. So I know for sure that that's going to be in there. Okay, now, enduring understandings, quick gloss overview of this, and I'll give you an example here. An enduring understanding is something that your students walk away from your course knowing about the target culture and about themselves. 
it goes far beyond the surface level objective of your units and like surface level doesn't mean bad it just means that this is what they learn about the world through the language acquisition process so let me give you one of my favorite examples for a level one class for a level one class if you're of course at some point gonna have to do greetings leave takings los saludos todo eso so for that, one of my favorite enduring understandings that students will learn, especially if they're learning Spanish or any kind of romance language, really, is that greetings reflect the social structure of different societies. Because they'll notice that right away, they will pick up on that without you having to tell them that. That's what it means by being an enduring understanding. This is not something that it, that you'll pull off of a document by ACFL or anything along those lines. It's something kind of like a can-do statement where you'll be able to craft it based on what your what units you're doing. So these greetings, as you're learning the differences between social structures and how your students should be talking to different people that they encounter, they're gonna pick up pretty quickly that the social structure and the stratification is much more rigid, more hierarchical than it is in American society, I guess you could say. Although, you know, a lot of that is blended. But it's much more in your face and obvious and the greetings themselves, it's embedded in the language. That's how you can pick up on it and see it, is that the, the way that we greet each other is definitely reflects who we think is important in society and who we think merits an extra level of respect. I wouldn't say more respect or anything along those lines, but like our elders, our superiors and things like that, we speak to them in a very obviously different way in romance languages than we do in English. That's an enduring understanding. Another enduring understanding that you could use, one that I one that I like about school, because there's especially usually a school unit in Spanish one, is that a society's perception, and like you don't have to use the, the kind of highfalutin language that I'm using here. This is just the best way I have to describe it. A society's perception of school slash importance is tied to geography, SES, hmm. let's just, let's just close it off there, is tied to geography and SES. No, let's do access. That's what I was looking for there. Access and SES. So what your students are gonna pick up on pretty quickly as they look at the differences in schooling and how students across the world who are the same age as them feel about school and how they feel about going to school, how much time other students spend at school, is they're gonna learn pretty quickly that where they are in the world, schooling is gonna be really tied to the social economic status of the students that they're talking to from different parts of the world. Like if your students are from a low SES and from that target culture, they're gonna usually find that school is really important to them. And if they are in a geographically isolated area, school might be not as important to them just for the sheer issue of access. So they're gonna find that in enduring understandings that that's a huge difference in from American culture that we have to a lot of the cultures that we're gonna be looking at in the target language is that that is much more evident. Although we have the same exact thing here in the US. Essential questions. Okay, so essential questions are gonna help you organize your curriculum by looking at what are your students going to ask and then be able to answer throughout the units. Like this side is the question and these are the answers. So I was just working on a unit actually for novice Spanish learners that was all about learning the dates and the times and calendars. And one of the essential questions that we have for this unit, especially with intercultural understandings or not understandings, but um, intercultural connections it's one of the ICCs. I'm forgetting exactly what the word is right now. Maybe one of y'all can save me because I'm forgetting what it is. 
Oh, let me check here. Oh, Grace. Grace is working at a private school, first through eighth grade, working with Voces Digital. Ooh, Digital. How do you like that? Flangu, no idea what that is. Surviving with Go Formative and using Somos Flex. You're literally using all of it. That's awesome. Oh, and you're using Fluency Matters. I love Fluency Matters. Cool. I've heard Garbanzo is awesome too. I've heard that app is really cool. I'm excited to hear that. All right, so you've got one through eight. So you ain't got a lot of time to work on your curriculum, right? That means that what you might be doing with this map specifically, and as you're looking at essential questions is you're compiling all of those resources on a daily basis. And it might even come with a curriculum map. So what you might be doing working with this here is seeing how can you tie all of those different elements together? How do all four, it looks like maybe five of those resources, how are you gonna make those work in a more seamless way together and use all of those to hit this, like your desired results. So Grace, your curriculum map is not gonna be so much about figuring out where your content's coming from or exactly, it's gonna be more about choosing which lessons you're gonna use from those resources each day. It's gonna be more about making sure that you're picking out the units, themes, and topics from the various things that you've got, especially since you're using some flex programs that will lead you in the right direction and will still feel seamless even though you've got a lot of different pieces working together. Most people do that. Most people have a few different things that they're working with. So don't even feel like that's a weird thing. That's how most people operate really. Because every program is gonna serve you in a different way, right? That's a good way to do it. Okay, so for essential questions, back to what we were saying earlier that before I got distracted, I just like seeing what y'all are talking about. The essential question that I was working with for this calendar unit for Spanish one is this to tie in with their intercultural connection. We're talking about birthdays and birthday parties. What day is the birthday party? When is the birthday party? What month is your birthday? What day is your birthday? And the essential question is, do people around the world celebrate birthdays the same as you? That's an essential question. And so you can see from something like this that and most of the, these questions are obviously not going to be in the target language. They're going to be in the L1. But when a student sees a question like that, they're automatic. And these essential questions are going to be pretty public. The enduring understandings, maybe not. Your students might not see those. You're going to be working towards them. But an essential question like that takes your unit that's about dates and calendars and days of the week, which is real stuffy. But, you know, we got to do it. They got to know what day it is. It takes it to a whole nother level of application with deeper meanings and deeper cultural connections. Oh, do people celebrate birthdays the same same way as me? And the answer is no. Even though most people in a lot of different cultures do celebrate birthdays, everybody does it a little bit different. And then you have an opportunity to explore and find resources that have to do with dates and times that aren't just the same old YouTube videos of different ways to say days of the week. <laughs> Ask me how I know. This is a good way to diversify your curriculum a little bit with authentic texts without falling down, you know, that terrible black hole that exists on YouTube. Intercultural communication. So this is where you're gonna be putting in, copy and paste those standards from ACTFL or the European equivalent that if you've seen the other classes, you know that I can never remember what the acronym is. It's like CEFR or something like that. But it's the, it's pretty much the exact same thing. They don't line up exactly the same way because they have six levels instead of the, the three that we're really used to as in the um, American style, I guess you could say with ACTFL, but it's the same jazz, same jazz because those two organizations work very much in cahoots with each other. But for intercultural communication, what you're going to work on here are these few different things. Behaviors interaction and the one that has to do with like identification and research. So that's like the products practices that lead to perspectives. So that's where yours, oh, that's what it is. Not identification, it's investigation. That's what it is. I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head. Investigation. 
So you see, we still have that products, practices, and perspectives that we're all used to from a few years ago, but now it's a little bit different because it's been added to a lot more layers, which is better. It is better. And what you're going to do with this is since you know that your goal is novice, novice mid to high, is go to the intercultural communications, the ICCs, and copy and paste here the five, I think it's about five, for novice level that you'll be able to find in there. It doesn't go into in between these like the other ones do, like low, mid, high. It's just all novice. Some examples for you, because I work with these a lot, it's kind of scary that I know these, is I can identify an inappropriate behavior in the target culture. can recognize appropriate behaviors and something along the lines of like, I can also use them. So we'll just behaviors. So we'll just keep that there for them. Oh, you know what it was? In my own and other cultures. Performance indicators. These are the ones that you know and love. These are the can-do statements. And the can-do statements are the way that you are going to make them unique to your specific situation, your unit, your topic, your theme, and all that good stuff, but are going to be based off of the overarching level indicator of proficiency for your students. So if we're trying to get to novice mid, we might use something for like interpersonal communication. I can express an opinion about a familiar and everyday topic. This is, I believe, no, this is novice mid. Using familiar and every, no, we already said everyday. Using familiar memorized phrases. And then what makes it novice high is when you can start to use original phrases. So that would be your novice mid one. What you're going to do for the performance indicators is start dumping in from your actual documents what all of these performance indicators are. So you got all the standards right there and that you know exactly where you want them to be. All right, stage two, assessment and evidence. If you're like me, I used to have a speaking quiz every week. So I know I'm gonna be organizing my content around that. Now that has to do, of course, with my structure and time frame, which was that I had block 90 minutes half the year. So they were ready for a quiz every week. I honestly probably should have been quizzing them more. But with 90 minutes half the year, that means that I get to see them technically on an everyday basis or I got to rather. Now, something that you might wanna think about is like, what does your final assessment look like? Like you're probably in the final assessment stage grounds right now, right? So what does yours look like? Are you in, are you gonna do a portfolio, which is really cool? Are you going to do some type of MOPI, which is a mock, that's an I, a mock OPI exam. Also really cool, just when you do an interview with students. And for your evidence, you can also think of different ways that you would like to maybe switch it up or do maybe like a task-based assessment. This is just a place for you to make sure that you know where your things are scheduled. I know that I would have to remember to schedule a summative assessment. Like for me, that was an IPA every three to four weeks. So that was something that I would write down here to make sure that my, my units were conducive to that structure. And the reason why is because that was a requirement for my school is that you know every three to four weeks we had something large that we could put in the grade book to balance those out. So what's your structure and your time frame? If you are teaching grades one through eight, oh my gosh, what does your structure and time frame look like? It's gonna look very different from us, right? From and what I mean by that is like from the the high school teachers like me, that's gonna look really different. 
if we're getting into units and themes and topics here, this is where you have the option. Hopefully you have a little bit of freedom with this. And if you don't, then you can probably leave this part out. But if you have a little bit of freedom, if you're at this class, then you're probably looking to create a curriculum map because you have a little bit of freedom. And if you have a little bit of freedom, here's some ideas that I have for you for units, themes, or topics. And here's a resource for you. This is a high frequency dictionary of Spanish and it's my new best friend. I'm using it all the time. This bad boy right here has all of the frequencies for a huge library of spoken word Spanish across all 21 Spanish speaking countries based off of subtitles from TV, all written in auditory media that they could gather. It's like a database of like 22 million words. It's wild. So through that, this book has this awesome index. I found it for $30 on Amazon. If you are getting into your units, themes, and topics, what this has in here, and this is how I'm creating my units, themes, and topics, is it has this really cool index of the frequency of things based on whatever topic you might be doing. So if you're doing food, if you're doing family, if you're doing time, you can use this to make sure that all the stuff that you're doing really is high frequency. Because if you look at stuff like animals, you'll find in there that even though it's really very interesting to do an animal unit, but it's not really that high frequency when it's coming to that kind of stuff. So I use that a lot to make sure that I am doing an exclusive unit on high frequency verbs, high frequency verbs, because there's a whole section in there that shows me the 100 most frequently used verbs in there. So I'm gonna say the top 50. And guess what that means? It means that my Spanish one content is not organized by types of verbs. It means that I am just going off of what are the top 50 verbs that my students need to be able to know because they're gonna see them the most. It also means that I'm gonna be able to look at some of the typical units, themes and topics that I might talk about and say that, well, you know, that might be a high frequency verb, but really I also need to think about context. Context is just as important as frequency when you are thinking about your units, themes or topics. So I'm going to leave you with this idea so you can jot down some ideas. Context, meaning where are your students when they're with you and they need to speak in the target language? For context, they're in the context of school, talking about friends, talking about activities, things teens slash kids like media and technology, because whether you like media and tech or not, your students are talking about it constantly. So for context, you also need to think about like, what are, what are teens talking about all of the time? These are units that they're going to want to be able to say in Spanish and that they're going to use a lot. Something else that they're of course going to want to know are things like language learner, words. That's of course going to be something in there, even though it's not technically high frequency. All of those aids, like, how do you say this? How can I get to what are you saying? Can you speak slower? All of those, all of those, I shouldn't say words, I should say phrases. All those, because we usually just gloss over those in the first few days, and then we never really touch on them again. Another one is going to be keeping the conversation going. So I would say things like rejoinders and conversation starters. Your students are learning how to speak. So conversation starters are going to be a big one for them. Hey, how's it going? How are you? How was your day? What are you doing tomorrow? What are you up to? Where do you go to school? Like conversation starters is a great topic for a unit. Like you could do a, even a unit topic that's like meeting a new friend. Like me, I've, I've always wanted to do a unit like this, meeting a new friend. Because can I tell you how many times that I was in a target language immersive environment, either in French or in Spanish, where I'm thinking to myself, this is common conversation between friends, but I've, I'm not in this situation often enough and I've never taught this, that I don't know the right phrases to say in the type of moment that's like, oh, 
cool to know that about you. Tell, tell me more. Like, I don't know what those, what a lot of those would be for this current age. Cause uh, you know, I'm working on textbooks and things like that. Like you need to watch TV in order to be up to date on all those things. Your students would love a unit on meeting a new friend and what it's like. How it can be like, like, what's your Facebook and things like that. I mean, they're not going to say that. They're going to say like, what's, what's your, what's your handle? Like, what's your Snapchat handle? Follow me on Snap and all that good stuff. You might also have for units, themes, and topics, you don't have to just stay in the very narrow lane of content-based things. You can do lots of things along the lines of skill-based. I think skill-based things are great. Um, describing, describing, describing environments. Ordering, buying things. Like there's so many different things that you could do. That doesn't necessarily rely so heavily on content. Like you don't have to be all gung-ho about let's go to the market. Your unit could just be ordering and buying things, how to order and buy things. And then you could teach them just the 15 core functional chunks and phrases that they need. And they could pick whatever content words they want for the things that they like to buy. That would be a really fun unit. I will let y'all go crazy on this because you know, this is what we love to do. This comes very naturally to us, picking out units, themes, and topics. And you probably already have a lot of them with the resources that you already have. Now, we're gonna get into the good stuff and start wrapping these up. Now that we have an idea of the structure, the skeleton of our curriculum, the time frame, and rough assessments in place, use this to sketch out what this is gonna look like for the course. This is going to be incredibly specific to your situation. So I'm gonna let you go on with your bad self about what this looks like. But let me give you some ideas on what you could do with this. You could type this out like I'm doing here. Like I know I'm gonna do a free <laughs> unit on language acquisition study. Somebody start counting. How many times do I do a typo? Somebody start counting, please. Please, I'll give you a prize if you get it right. Your prize will be my love. It's a good prize. So I'm definitely gonna start with a pre-unit on language acquisition and study. And then the next thing that I'm gonna move into right after that, I usually also do like a, a little mini, mini in giant letters. That counts, count it, count it for the typo count. I usually do a mini social justice unit with a high frequency verb focus so that students can start talking. I usually do that in the middle of the pre-unit. This is like all together. So that's like a three week thing. Cause that has to go back to my empathetic global citizens and all that good stuff. And then being able to talk, we go right into language from day one. But the next thing that I'm gonna wanna do now that I have a space to sketch is I know that it's, well, it's time for a speaking quiz. So I'm gonna start making sure that we get into the, those HFEs baby. And then I'm gonna do a novel for a little bit to really hit home those HFEs. And then you're gonna start being able to put in timeframes here. That's how you might wanna use this space. You could just do like a quick outline and maybe you'll put timeframes here like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, all that good stuff. What you can also do is if you're printing this out is you could draw squares to fit in all of your units and how they line up together. We could do something like October to November, something like that. This is a space for you to outline and figure out what your learning plan is really going to be and how you're going to get there, how you're gonna use this. Ooh, and now we're into the last part, okay. So now we're into core structures and skills. So I told you here that one of the reasons that I do this, ooh, Count it, count it, put it on the board. That I do a pre-unit on language acquisition and study. And then I mix in a little bit of high frequency verb focus on the very first day for my Spanish one students and my French one students is that for their core structures and skills, I know that in order for them to be able to get to that novice low range, they need to be able to say things, right? And they need to be able to say the most important, most use words in the language. They're, what do I mean by that? I mean that since I want them to be able to understand me, I'm going to make sure that I'm teaching the things that are used 
the most in the context that we live in. So for me, that's gonna be high frequency structures and verbs. So the core structures and skills is I'm gonna do the super seven verbs. It's usually what I do. In the first few days of classes, I'll pick two or three of those. And they're all gonna be in first person. And another core structure and skill that I know my students need to have is if they're going to understand other people and be able to interact with them, then they're definitely going to need interrogatives. The next thing that they're going to need if they're going to be working with especially a survival level of interaction, I know that some of the most frequent things that they're going to need to do is they're going to need to be able to buy and request things as a traveler. So I'm going to do buying phrases, requesting things, which has to do with interrogatives. So I might do an advanced question unit so that students are able to ask whatever kind of questions that they would like to, those really useful question phrases on you know, those base 16, I can get anywhere I need to. I can find a bathroom, I can find a restaurant, I can find a place to have fun, I can get directions those types of things. But a short one, a very short one. And then in here, you're going to fill in all those content words that match up with that. So buying and requesting for an advanced question unit for getting around town, it's going to be where is the dot dot dot. Bathroom, store, restaurant, so on and so forth. This is where you're gonna to start to put in all of your content words. And this is obviously small, right? Like you're not gonna fit in all of your content words here. It's just a place to start where your ideas are going to be. And you could fill in multiple copies of this, of course. So ladies and gents, we are coming on the end here of our class with, you know, a solid start to this map. I will tell you that the first time that you sit down and do this, it's not all gonna just, flow out of you. It takes a little bit to create a really solid curriculum map. And I created this for you because I can't tell you how many times that I've sat down when I've had a little bit of time to work on my curriculum during maybe like a PD day or something along those lines and having no idea where to even start. So this is my number one advice for you. When you're trying to sharpen up your curriculum a little bit, maybe put together all the different resources that you've got or all the ideas that you come up with during the summer that you've been saving to a Pinterest board for a really long time. And then you actually get into your room and you realize all the things that you have to do before the back to school season. This is my number one advice for you for curriculums. Just start organizing. Start with the first two weeks of class. Make sure that you've got that mapped out. And then after that, after things start to settle, get into this curriculum map and figure out where you want the rest of your year to go. And investing a little bit of time in organization up front is going to save you lots of hair pulling down the road and lots of moments when you're sitting at your desk at the end of the day and your copies aren't done and you're trying to figure out what on earth you're going to teach tomorrow and how you're going to do it. This curriculum map makes sure that a lot of that Whew. a lot of those decisions are already made for you with that upfront thinking and the little bit of organization to guide you because you can just whoop, quick pop into this and see whatever resource that you have in front of you. Is it actually going to meet the needs of what I'm trying to do? Because I bet you that many of the resources that you have at your fingertips, even though they might get you through a day, which is okay, like do that by all means, but you'll notice that doing that every day is not going to get you to the goals that you really have for your students and that when you are following something like a curriculum map you're going to get to where you want to be and experience a lot less of that daily frustration with a lot less time planning as well i hope this really helps to organize things for you that you've got a little bit of an example to go with and that you have maybe a few ideas of your own of how you can maybe organize some ideas for your curriculum. This is not by any means the end of your curriculum journey. You've got a lot of cool things that you could do with it. And I hope that it helps you.
make sure that you download this map so that you got somewhere to put all of your ideas. And I'm so grateful that you were able to join me for this class. It has been really fun to hang out with you today. Come back next week because we got another class for curriculum and it's gonna be so good. That one's gonna be for everyone, not just for Spanish one teachers. And have you heard the news? Did you know this? Did you know this? It's really exciting. It's really exciting. Make sure that you are on my newsletter, which you will get on if you download this curriculum map because the big conference is coming back. So save the date, save it. July 19th through the 21st, Practical and Comprehensible is coming back at you. And it's gonna be even better than before. So I will catch you hopefully next week and definitely this summer. Thanks y'all for a great class. I'll see you later.